This would be an empty world without the blues. I try to take that emptiness and fill it up with something. But they want to call me Mother Blues. That's all right with me. It don't hurt none. <laughs> yeah! It does hurt. Chadwick Boseman, we love you. Welcome to Cord Killers, the show about watching the stuff you love when you want, where you want, however you want. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey, I'm Brian Brushwood. Uh, what, what did we got? What, what did we just see, Bryce? That was a trailer for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, a new film adaptation of, an, of a very old play starring Viola Davis as the titular Ma Rainey and the final performance of the late Chadwick mm -hmm. Boseman as her ambitious horns player. Um, is she Ma Rainey is one of the first uh, professional blues artists, uh, the first professional African-American blues artists and one of the first ones who had been recorded. Uh, that that's how long ago it was. Um, and so the film, so we're about, talking Robert Johnson era kind of stuff. Yeah. And so it kind of follows her and her horn player and the white music producers that they're interfacing with that comes to Netflix, uh, December 18 it is rated R. Right Find on. out which songs Led Zeppelin ripped off from Ma Rainey in the coming <laughs> Netflix. Uh, hey, uh, Brian, what Yo. do you say we get to our primary target? Yeah, let's dive in. Our first story today is thanks to Germany. Danke schön. Uh, German mobile measurement company Adjust released a report on subscription services in the United States. Adjust worked with CensusWide to survey 1,003 TV and streaming customers aged 16 to 60 in the U.S. between September 23rd and September 29th. So recently, this is recent behavior during the lockdown. What are you guys doing? What are you watching? What are you subscribing to? That's the key. Streaming video apps made up 30.7% of subscription-based app downloads, followed by gaming and then news. So if you were downloading something and paying for a subscription, a third of the people were doing it to watch some video. Consumers who use streaming and entertainment services, and here's the thing that caught my eye, Brian, spent an average of $33.58 a month. That's how much people are spending on streaming, according to this data. Uh, Netflix, Amazon Prime Video, Hulu, Disney+, and YouTube TV made up the top five favorite streaming services amongst those surveyed. So that 3358 caught my eye, Brian, because I've wondered if you really are saving money, if people are in fact keeping control of their streaming services, even though we all complain about having too much choice and it costs too much if I wanted to get everything, are we actually doing it? And this would imply no, we're just buying a few of them. So I'd be curious to figure out, I know that about five years ago, we started to dial back. I think we were early on pretty heavy on the rhetoric of it sucks to be paying $120 a month for your cable. You can almost surely go a la carte and spend less. And then we started to see research that indicated that once you do go a la carte, what you do is you spend that same $120 a month just over an entire buffet of options. So we start, sort of dialed back our rhetoric on this show and focused more on having the freedom of choice and getting what you want, when you want, on whatever device you want. But I got to admit, I'm just as surprised as you are that we're saving money, which on the one hand is sort of the point of watching what you want. And we've talked for a very long time about how you're able to easily, you know, stop a subscription, start a subscription. It's just a click of a button, no big deal. So it makes sense that at any given time, you probably would, wouldn't be watching but 25% of all the things that you're paying for on a fire hose service like cable, right? Yeah, uh, and, and to be fair, both what we talked about before and this could be true because this doesn't exclude cable TV subscribers. So, Got it. so in, this could in, be previously top. we said, if you get rid of your $120, how much do you end up spending, right? This is everybody, whether they still have cable or not, how much are they spending? And I, I, I imagine that's going to bring it down because if you're paying $120 for cable, you're less likely to spend a lot on the extra services. Uh, so that, that isn't teased out of this, but it's still, it's still lower than I would have expected. Uh, given that, you know, there's a good several million people out there uh, streaming video only and YouTube TV was among the top five. So some of those higher priced 50 to $80 streaming services that bring you multiple channels 
are being downloaded and used by this group. So let's play the fantasy game of, let's say you have a budget of $33 and 58 cents per month. What mm -hmm. do you spend it on and, and how much can you get for that? Yeah. So Netflix is 15. That's going to knock out half your budget pretty much. Probably right worth then. it. But, but, yeah. but again, as easy as it is to turn it on and turn it off, uh, I don't know, maybe not. Uh, well, right. Cause you can just say like, oh, I'm going to watch it for the, you know, I'm big fan of Bly house. It's the most recent one I could think of. Uh, uh, or, or let's say the crown, example. the crown, the, the crown's coming out. It's, it's a lot more popular. No. I'm a big fan of the crown. Stick with Actually Bly the house. crown works because you could say like, I'm not going to get Netflix now. I'm going to wait till the crown comes out in November. So for now I can go ahead and add in a $6 CBS all access. Cause I'm going to, go with the commercials to make my dollars go a little longer. I'll get the Hulu with commercials. That's $10, I think, you know, and you, you can start building in little bricks like that. Uh, you probably don't go with a $15 HBO max. You certainly wouldn't do Netflix and HBO max because then that's only going to leave you three bucks. Although worth noting, like I'm now fully on the HBO max train and it's because it's totally free with my AT&T internet subscription. Uh -huh. So I'm paying exactly uh -huh. $0 and I got to admit, uh, after, after having COVID for two weeks and pillaging all of the various lands of internet streaming content, it was like going to HBO max. I was like so much fresh movies to consume. <laughs> Are you still paying right. the HBO now also? Cause you did have that before. I did. Uh, I only set it up over there like five days ago. So I need to cancel HBO now, to be honest, uh, I, I don't see. remember whether or not HBO now is, I bought it through Apple or Amazon. So I have to find that out. Easy. Yeah. And then there's free trials. Uh, they're going away more and more. We'll talk about that later in the show. But if you have that Apple TV plus free trial, uh, we mentioned last week that that's being extended. Uh, so, so you could probably pad out your watching a little bit with that. And I think this explains why we're seeing more popularity of the free stuff, the Tubi's, the Zumo's, the Pluto TV's, the Roku uh, app, uh, the Roku streaming service app. Uh, is, is people are like, well, I'll, I'll spend 30 bucks on the things I really want. And then I'll pad it out with some of that free stuff. Yeah. I wonder how much, uh, how much is people acting value conscious? Bryce, do you consider yourself to be like super, um, uh, I don't know how to phrase it. That doesn't sound negative connotation, but like, 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 are you, are you real dialed in on like 50 cents here or there? Or, or, or do you tend to wave your hands and be all like, it's less than the hundred dollars of cable. Uh, I tend to be a little more wary when it comes to subscriptions. Cause if it's one offs, if it's an app or something, I'll go and buy an app. Um, but that stuff, uh, because I'm subscribed to a lot of this stuff already, that adds up and that does kind of creep up on you. And the, the fact that they're all smaller and kind of piecemeal kind of hides the total fact. So I, I, I know that I pay for Hulu with no ads and I pay for a Netflix plan and HBO and, and other, all these other things, but I actually couldn't tell you what the total price of that is because I'm paying through different things and I haven't right. added up. So I get, I do get wary about adding another thing on top of everything. And, and so you, you only notice when you can't pay rent. Yes. <laughs> and like, Wait, maybe I should Sorry, pay you're exactly $5 and 99 cents shy. <laughs> maybe we could go yeah. without Hulu. Was Ted Lasso that good? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 this, the thing about control is it also is responsibility. That's the downside of cord cutting. You have total control, but you have to pay attention. Uh, and it is easy for that stuff to, uh, to creep up on you. I, I just found this fascinating uh, and we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. I'd be curious if folks out there can you know, tally up what you were spending for streaming services. And are you still a cable subscriber or not? Cordkillers at gmail.com. If you'd like to share that info with us, we will keep it anonymous. Heck yeah. But most importantly, if you want to keep us loud, live and independent, why don't you head on over to patreon.com slash cordkillers. It's you beautiful 1000 plus bosses that keep so us in business. Every Monday we show up giving you all the info on how to watch what you want, when you want or whatever dang device you please. And we can't thank you enough. Head on over to patreon.com slash cordkillers. You get your very own RSS feed. You get the, uh, the spoiler in time at the exact same time in the exact same feed plus the exclusive after talk where it's just you me tom and bryce for it's and a secrets. secret clubhouse yeah. sometimes guests yeah every once in a while yeah mm -hmm. meryl barl slip in there and you get bonus stuff mm -hmm. patreon.com slash cord killers go check it out let's talk about how to watch 
Well, as cord killers and before that frame rate, uh, Brian and I have spent more than a decade now helping you watch what you want, when you want, where you want. And lately, a new way people want to watch is apparently in a privately rented theater. Uh, we talked about Alamo Drafthouse starting this a while back, and everybody else is jumping on board now as well. Cinemark is offering theater rentals for around 20 people for $99. That'll get you an old movie. If you want a new wide release movie like a Tenet, it'll cost you $150. AMC started doing the same thing, $99 to $349. There may be some other perks they throw in for that more expensive price. AMC is also charging you $100 to rent a microphone. Uh, hold, hold on. Uh, $250 per half hour to get early access to the theater before your movie shows and $250. If you want to bring in outside food, not like I'm, I'm bringing in a hamburger in my purse, but like catering, like you want to have somebody come in uh, and give you food. So AMC is really pushing this as an event space. Like, Hey, you want to have your quinceanera with a movie? Uh, come on in. We've got the microphones. So you can announce everybody like this is a thing. It's pretty cool. Uh, deadline sources say that Cinemark has sold more than 22,000 watch parties, largely boosted by the movie Tenet. It makes up about a third of, not tenant, but the watch parties make up about a third of Cinemark's business right now. This past weekend, Cinemark's Lincoln Square 22 in Seattle and the Redwood 20 in San Francisco ranked as the number two and 10 highest growing seeing locations for Tenet. Now, Tenet only took in $1.6 million in its eighth weekend. It is now just past $50 million domestic, but it shows that they're able to like bring in some extra money eight weeks into a release because of that. And, uh, they need the money. There's a cash crunch. AMC said last Tuesday its cash will be gone by late this year or early next. It is exploring potential sources of additional liquidity. That means selling stuff off, including assets, uh, maybe doing some joint ventures, bringing in some minority investments. In better news, though, AMC said it's opening a dozen theaters in New York State October 23rd, and it claims reopening in New York City is, quote, not far away. So, Brian... Uh, are you going to rent a theater? I, I, if I can, dang right. Uh, there, there are two threads that we could pursue on this. One is, this is a smart idea and it's long overdue. And uh, in the before four time, you would say, okay, what is it that you have, theater owner? And the first thing we would blurt out is an absolute lock on the 90-day window of new releases. Okay, now you don't have that. What do you have? And they say... 300 chairs and a really big screen. Great. Now <laughs> we're dealing with machine. reality. Yeah. Let's talk right. about how you monetize what you actually have, not what you wish you still have, uh, which, which brings up the other thread is how late is this? How long ago should they have been doing this? This is, this is a case where I'm sorry that it took this long for you to hit the rude awakening stage. I'm sorry that you're, you're being bent over a barrel by the, just by the distributors of all this content. But this is all, you've always had that giant screen. You've always had those 300 seats. I'm sorry that it took all of this for you to realize that maybe you could be flexible about what those things mean and what you could do with them. The, and all the pieces were there. That's the thing to think about. You could buy out a theater. It just cost a lot more, two to $4,000 if you wanted to buy out a theater because they only showed new releases. Or you could see an older movie but it had to be like a Fandango events thing. You couldn't come in and say, I want to watch Hocus Pocus. And you could rent a theater for your private event, but they wouldn't show you movies. And keep That was just mind, renting the theater for a private event. This brings all of their advantages together for an affordable price. I think, I think to some degree, there is a bit of inertia from like by the mid nineties, uh, movies were still pretty much on film and to get a specific movie on film required you to rent it and have it sent over in a bunch of canisters. You take the six reels, you assemble them together in one giant platter and all that stuff. You had to splice them and all that stuff. So there There's were significant rules costs. about how often you can show it before you have to return the canister and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it makes sense 20 years ago that this was a problematic business model, but we've been digital for a fair bit now. And now we're in an age where, you know, why not have a, you know, a halo tournament or what have you. Uh, yeah. In fact, 8-Bit XD asked, can we play games? I've seen that. I've seen like, come have a birthday party and play video games on the big screen at the theater. Like they have had these ideas, but they just couldn't get through to the thing that would actually catch people's attention, which is like movies. Don't you want to rent out a movie theater and watch a movie? 
It's like, yeah, sure. You can play games and that's cool. And that's fun. And they've tried that. People weren't apparently that interested. It's not like movie theaters have been switching over to that. I think this does. I think you're right, Brian. It's them saying, let's stop looking at the 90 day model and look at what we've got right. and figure out, you know what, if you, here's where the bargaining I think could come in. Hey, we'll loosen up on the 90 day. If you loosen up on which movies we can show. And what it costs. And I think that the behind the scenes of all of this is this is them admitting that they've lost the battle with the movie distributors. Like they admit, hey, uh, you guys, you guys have us. You have us. And if you want to do day and date release, we have no power. And we're finally admitting it. And we're trying to look for money in other ways. Yeah, I mean, to be clear to anybody listening, they haven't admitted they're giving up on day and date. I at mean, all. except for this business model that <laughs> seems to be an admission that they've Well, but given this up. isn't day and date. Well, well, this no, no, is no, no. What, what I mean is, is these are the actions. If actions speak louder than words, these are the right. actions you take when in your heart of hearts, you know you've lost you that know, battle. You know right. you're going to have that's, to give that's it what up. I'm and they and they have given up the 90 day. At right. least AMC has, right? Uh, so yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. All right. Uh, we do all this stuff so we can watch things. So let's talk about what to watch and under surveillance. I remember we talked about soul from Pixar uh, going from theaters to Disney plus it is coming to Disney plus December 25th and uh, they have a trailer out for it. And it looks like a delightful Pixar movie. If you haven't heard anything about it, Jamie Foxx plays a teacher that gets sucked into the place that many of you might call heaven, but I don't think they call it that in the trailer, uh, where he tries to jump off a bridge that's taking him to the afterlife, and he ends up in the before life, uh, where souls are prepared to go down to Earth, and he starts helping a soul uh, who is voiced by Tina Fey to get ready for her life. Can can I explore and kind of unpack my visceral reaction to this trailer? And I don't, yeah, yeah. I personally don't understand why I felt this way. Uh, things that we can accept as fact in this discussion. Number one, I'm certain that soul will be a very, very good movie and almost certainly make me cry at some point. Number sure. two, I know Coco was a very, very good movie that did make me cry at one point. Number three, the trailer for Coco felt like a delightful exploration of, uh, an, an other world. Um, Four, I hated this trailer. Why? <laughs> it uh, felt it felt preachy and like you're gonna tell me about your after like like it's as though somebody focused on all the wrong parts of pitching me the good place. Like imagine all the things you could say about the good place that would come across as sanctimonious and 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 too heavy and and it would be the wrong way to pitch the good place. I feel like they did all those things in here. I I, I don't understand. Here's another thing I noticed, and maybe it will be a puzzle piece that will explain your reaction. I noticed we didn't hear from Tina Fey until almost to the end of the trailer and what she said sounded flat. Yeah. I wonder if they're busy re-recording all of Tina Fey's bits it was, it was with not Tina Fey. I'm not replacing her, right? Like they just didn't come out right. And so they had to edit this trailer around that. It's, I don't know that, it's probably wrong, but I was like, why aren't we hearing from Tina Fey? And for whatever reason, we're not hearing from Tina Fey. That is what makes this trailer weird is like, I kept waiting for Tina Fey to go, I'm in the before life. You're going to be my guide. Come on, let's go. And you never got that scene. Yeah. Gauchum in the chat says that Pixar trailers are usually pretty bad. I don't know that mm, I go so true. far as usually. I could certainly think of a few that have been bad. And usually it's the early ones. But but they usually reveal the true voice of of the show as it gets closer to release time, but man, I didn't feel it on this. I felt like everything was that high level. It sounded like a pitch meeting and, and not, like I never smiled. I never laughed. I never found I kept everything waiting for flat. the meeting scene. And all we got was him meeting the before life with like, don't worry. Souls can't be crushed here. That's what earth is for. I was like, ha 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 Pixar joke. I, okay. It's going to be full of those gigs. I expect that. And then I was waiting for the like, hi, I'm the Tina Fey character. And you never got that. Weird. Maybe that's what it was. It was as though the trailer started and they're like, before you even watch Soul, you should get into the tedium of the rules about what souls can and can't do. <laughs> yes, was, yes. Th that's what there it was felt a lot like. of like, here's let me describe for you the movie you're going to watch. I'm like, no, just show me. Show yeah. me the bits. Uh, yeah. And, and and in fact, it made me think of uh there's been a number of times we've pitched shows uh out in Hollywood, and uh there was a recent time that I realized, oh wait, the moment you say 
and they're really funny, you've lost. Because if you're really funny, you should be having people laugh and not explaining yeah. how you're really funny. Yeah, you'll say, and then we'll do this, and the people you're pitching to laugh. That's right, what, exactly. Yeah, and and right. that's they, they they were telling, not showing in this. Maybe yeah. it's not. Yeah. Maybe it's not a. A, maybe it's not a comedy. Good and, movie. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm sure it's going to be a good movie. Pixar's got a great track record. Maybe it's a very sad movie. <laughs> but I mean, it it, it might. It might be very, very sad, and it also could just be that they don't want to give away too much stuff. Like, I was watching a trailer earlier for something mm. we're not going to talk about today, and it showed mm. the entire movie, and it made me not want to watch this movie. Was it Get Out? No, it was... Because um, <laughs> uh, they definitely showed the whole movie in Get Out. Right, and, and like I walked out of Get Out and then looked at the trailer and said, go watch, go out, and don't watch this trailer because it shows you everything. Maybe, maybe it's just that. Maybe they don't mm. want to give it up. Could could be, but but I and and in a normal year that would feel like a Pixar play. But I suppose I'm on high alert because they're releasing this for free behind the Disney Plus curtain, and it would make me feel like, man, you better sell this hard. And, and I didn't yeah. feel very well sell. Do sold. you do you need a harder sell or a softer sell when it's on Disney Plus? Because a lot of people have Disney Plus, and it's way cheaper than buying a ticket. I need I need more showing in a telling this was all i telling. need the the moment where tina fey's character is introduced to me yeah and she was not introduced mm -hmm. to me in this trailer yeah like but you're both gonna watch this movie like, like okay from oh, the mark? yes of course we are uh, uh from the trailer describe to me the conflict as as it's portrayed in the trailer like i guess the he guy wants loves to go back to the guy i know the guy loves music because they spent 30 seconds telling us he loves music and hears it everywhere uh -huh. and we know he dies but and he goes back to Earth because he wants to go back, bring, come back to life. Okay, so what's the conflict? Right, because he has the to conflict go, should be has to figure that out. <laughs> he sneaks out with Tina Fey's character, or he's assigned to Tina's Fey character, but he doesn't want to. That's the missing piece, right? Yeah. Like, why does he go back to Earth? I mean, you're right. You may be right, Bryce. It may be a spoiler to tell us any of that stuff. Yeah, I feel like I, I feel like I got the answer, and it's he wants to go back. He wants to not be dead, and either succeed well, in coming sure. back to life or well but okay, then why but would we, they send him well, back right. i don't think they back? sent him back it looked like he just left well uh, he left the line to go into the afterlife but mm -hmm. how did he get from the before life back to I earth mean, I, here, here's he what i suspect a hole. i suspect uh that this is pretty much much the way that uh cars was doc hollywood this is heaven can wait and they're gonna stuff mm -hmm. him in another body mm -hmm. and hijinks will ensue or whatever but they dare not tell us that because that will be right. an end of first act reveal uh, or some something of that caliber, and so this trailer is specifically obtuse for the benefit of preserving that. It could be right. Could whatever, be right. whatever that, that, that is, that rings true, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's watch something we all know is good: peanut specials. Oh, Apple man, TV you Plus. Buy those. Uh, <laughs> Apple TV Plus has announced it will add the peanut specials I bought last year to its catalog, so I didn't need to buy them at all. Oh. That includes It's the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown, a Charlie Brown Thanksgiving, and a Charlie Brown Christmas, all bundled together last year in a low, low price that I bought. Uh, each will have a time period where they will be available free to non-subscribers, but that's limited. So you don't have to have Apple TV Plus to watch them, but you have to watch them in the date range around their associated holiday. Uh, and new specials are announced, including uh, one on Mother's Day, Earth Day, New Year's Eve, and Back to School. And in addition to uh, the Snoopy Space Show, The Snoopy Show arrives on Apple TV Plus on February 5th. That is actually not a bad way to seduce people into giving Apple TV Plus a try, uh, because it does feel like around that time of year, you're like, oh, this thing I remember, and having it be free seems like a, a good faith gesture that I think works. It is a bummer that they're now giving for free the stuff that you pay for. I mean, for. that's just always the way when someone adds a free thing that you already bought. I mean, I... I bought all the Marvel movies too, and they added them to Disney Plus. So it's just going to happen. But none of that is what I really want to talk about, which is I don't know how those specials hold up. I tried to get my kids to watch them, and boy, oh, boy uh -huh. do they not land. <laughs> the <laughs> Christmas one is holds up in the sense of it doesn't feel insanely dated yeah, when i watched it last it's year it's super timeless it's it's like but watching it, a, it, a penny movie movie right or but it may not appeal to a modern child's sensibility right yeah yeah and maybe that's why they're making these new specials to be like yeah but we'll make this new stuff that will i don't know mother's day Earth not that day. mother's day's bad but like was it i don't know seems like a weird one to have a peanut special for 
Yeah. Especially because there are not parents. I mean, there are parents in Peanuts, but they're all... Wah, 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 right? Wah, wah, wah. Like, I, that's going to be... Weird, Earth Day, maybe. even more so. Because the Earth goes wah, 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 too. And it's like, come on, say something. This this is the part, like, I don't want to keep having this conversation because I don't want to be the guy standing on... You know, pooping on Charlie Brown special no, island. Oh, you know, no, like, no, like, no, no. Yeah, and I also don't want to be pooping on Mother's Day. Like Mother's yeah. Day is amazing, right? Like you can go so wrong so fast. It just they seem like odd choices. New Year's Eve, it seems like oh, they didn't have a New Year's Eve one. I guess they didn't. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You remember that classic moment where the ball's going down and they say, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> they did have Arbor Day. There is an Arbor Day <laughs> peanut special that I did not see mentioned in this. So I wonder if oh. that was part of it. Uh, George Miller has announced the cast for Furiosa, the forthcoming prequel movie to Mad Max Fury Road. Anya Taylor-Joy, whom you might know from either Peaky Blinders or Split, plays the young Furiosa. Chris Hemsworth, Thor, is playing Dementus. And Yahya Abdul-Mateen II, uh, Dr. Manhattan in Watchmen, is playing Praetorian. Production is expected to begin late 2021 or early 2022, and a sequel called The Wasteland is also being developed. That one's a little farther off. So this is the part where we divorce ourselves from our over overcoming wave of love for Mad Max Fury Road, everything George Miller's done, Mad Max is amazing, uh, that movie is, is perfect in every way, and instead we, we back up a thousand feet away and we ask ourselves realistically, how important are the words Mad Max? Because Mad Max Fury Road already has very little mm. Mad Max in it. It's already a movie about Furiosa. And truthfully, with a thousand foot view, divorced from how we feel about this intellectual pro property or that movie, do you think that just a movie Furiosa is going to do, is going to perform as well? well critically let's assume it's equally so as good I'm as mad max i'm assuming this this will be marketed as mad max furiosa part of the mad max right I mean, they'll throw there's... that out there but what i think you're asking is a more important question if this is just furiosa this is, furiosa is carrying this and and it's not charlie's theron Right. Who they they talked about de-aging her and they're like, mm, it's just going to, we don't have the budget. It's just not going to work. Charlize Theron has blessed it and said, no, Anya Taylor-Joy is a great choice. Uh, I think this is awesome. Go, go with my blessing and do this. Then it just becomes about the story. It doesn't really, none of that matters if the story is really good. I disagree. I think many a good story has withered on the vine and has not gotten, let me introduce you to a television show I once saw called Firefly. It had a very, very good story, but it lacked a Vulcan named Spock and a captain named Kirk. Therefore, it, it lasted, you know, 10 episodes. Or well, it also long. lacked a primetime slot and a proper rollout and lots of other things. Like, and, this is going to get top-level promotion. People are going to say, oh, it's the new Fury Road. I love that movie. I'll try it out. So I don't think Discovery will be a problem for Furiosa. Oh, man, I wish I could agree with you. Man, I want to agree with you. I, I don't know that I do, though. And, I, I, and to be honest, I disagree. I don't think they'll... I, I don't know how you wedge the word Mad Max unless you go Furiosa, a Mad Max movie, parentheses. No, you just call Mad it Max. Mad Max colon Furiosa. But but there's but 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 absent any Mad Max, I don't know how you do I I don't know. There how were you... no Star Wars in most of the Star Wars. Yeah, there were wars in every single episode. Mad Max is just the Star Wars that you pop up at the top. Ooh, courtkillers at gmail.com. Chime in on this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Variety reports uh, coming to America 2 starring Eddie Murphy is being sold by Paramount to Amazon. Uh, so this is just reported. It's not confirmed yet, but the idea is that Amazon is pretty much all but agreed uh, to be the, the distributor or to be the place that Paramount will distribute to. Paramount's the distributor of Coming to America 2 and Amazon will be the movie company uh, with an expected streaming premiere of December 18th. Now, in in days before COVID-19, we would have expected Amazon to do a 90-day release. That's what they've done. When they get these big movies, they put them out in theaters under the Amazon logo for 90 days, then they bring them to Prime Video. Uh, with a December 18th date, I'm imagining that's not what they're going to do, especially given the times we're in. Uh, so, so sorry, uh, December 18th of next year, not, not weeks from now, December 18th. Uh, that is a very good clarification. It just says December 18th in <laughs> wow, the Variety that would be insane article. insane if they've secretly been doing all this. Uh, well, they, they, they've already got it, right? 
Uh, yeah, I guess so. So uh, uh, I think it's already in the can. Like it's already edited. It just okay. needs to be distributed. Shoot. So maybe it is right around the corner. So so which is stronger in your heart? Your uh, affinity for the masterpiece that is the original Coming to America or your steely-eyed gaze upon how successful reboots of successful previous franchises have been on streaming platforms? I think I'm going to put all my money on Eddie Murphy and say, okay, we just kind of ha saw him step back into the limelight recently. He's great national treasure. Uh, hopefully the movie doesn't drag him down. If the movie is good enough that he can carry it, I think it'll be enjoyable. It's so funny that you said, I'm going to put my money on Eddie Murphy because I just wanted to scream, that's not helpful. Eddie Murphy's a wild card. It might be Pluto Nash. It might be, it might be wrong. I, I don't know. <laughs> like, like well, you're but, right. But I, I don't know which Eddie Murphy solid, we're going to get. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, the, the, the plot is interesting. It's, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they need him to go back to the country he came from in the original movie because the king is dying and he's about to uh, ascend to the throne. But the dying king wants the grandson uh, to, to be trained in the place. And what Eddie Murphy's character didn't realize is that he had a son and his son lives in Brooklyn and has no idea that he's an heir to this throne. So it's the reverse. Instead oh, of coming to America, it's coming from America. That could be fun. That could be really yeah. fun. And, yeah, and I exactly. could see, I could see, I mean, again, it, it depends on how much effort we see Eddie Murphy show up with, because we've seen him be very, very good lately. And we've, we've seen him be uh, phoning it in uh, recently. Yep. Uh, that's why I said my money's on Eddie Murphy. Just like uh, putting your money on any roulette wheel number, it can fail you. <laughs> Uh, Monster Hunter, a movie based on the video game of the same name and directed by Paul W.S. Anderson, released a trailer. Uh, Mila Jovovich plays Captain Artemis, a character created for the film, coming to theaters in December, according to the trailer. Uh, but I like this approach of Mila Jovovich being you, you're being the player character and getting to learn. She doesn't know anything about this world. She gets sucked into it and has to navigate it just like you would the first time you played the game. I do like that idea. I remember about the Half-Life series, uh, one of the development interviews, they were talking about how hard it is to write for video games because your principal character doesn't know their marks, doesn't know their lines, doesn't know the plot. And you have to spell that out for them. I'd be really curious to see how that manifests itself in the movies. Uh, Bryce, I, 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 I hesitate to admit, I'm not familiar with the Monster Hunter franchise. Are you? Uh, I know a little bit about it. It's um, kind of a, 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 it's like an RPG, but it's generally very slow. Um, you're, you're going around and hunting monsters in these big open worlds. Um, I, I think a lot of the trailer looks all right. I think it's very weird having the primary character and kind of her whole squadron be military because the world of monster hunter is very much like a fantasy kind of um s sort of uh not primordial what am i thinking of like uh prehistoric Primeval. sort of a prehistoric sort of mm -hmm. era in in a lot of those games and so the mixture of like modern military feels weird but maybe that's how they sell it to people uh it was cool seeing a big sword there's not really guns in the game but there are big big chunky swords it's like that big sword <laughs> Yeah, so if you'd like to see a big sword, uh, put on a mask and head to an open theater near you in December. Uh, <laughs> or I rent one. Yeah, or just, yeah, could I rent? Uh, actually, that would be a fun one to rent, right? Because you could all sit around and joke and laugh and... Huh. Uh, I actually think, um, uh, uh, back to that story, I, I think that a lot of businesses have had to stay open and have essentially potified, you know, where it's like everyone mm -hmm. comes in. Like, uh, I, I wouldn't do it for my family, but between all the families of everybody who's kind of here-ish, I mean, now you're getting up to 20, 30 people, and, and all of a sudden it becomes not crazy to rent a theater. Yeah, if you're, you're people who are sharing a space anyway, right. uh, and, and, and so you're like, well... If I'm going to get infected from these people, it won't be at the theater because I'm living with them, working with them, whatever. Then, yeah, kind of makes sense to be like, Man, let's just all run a theater together. Yeah. Not risk any strangers in there. Uh, a few other notes here. Yellowstone, which airs on the Paramount Network, uh, will stream exclusively on Peacock. Yes, Yellowstone airs on the Paramount Network owned by Viacom CBS. But Viacom CBS decided not to give it to its own CBS All Access, but instead give it to NBC's Peacock. Season three arrives on Peacock November 22nd. Yellowstone is apparently uh, the most watched cable TV show of 2020. 
I feel terrible that I know nothing about Yellowstone. Mm, I don't know anything about it either. <sighs> other than now we're in a cool club. <laughs> All of you who know guy... something about it, you can't be in the club. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing. It's, it's on Paramount Network. That's what makes me surprised. Having a most watched cable TV show that I, I don't watch is not surprising. Uh, I don't watch all the shows on cable television, right? This one stars Kevin Costner, so I understand that it's going to have some name attraction. But how many people get the Paramount Network? Uh, 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 I IDK. I but, but enough. Enough. I, do you think we're going to see more of this or we're going to see more siloing of everybody having their own you know, umbrella? This and a few other stories we'll, we're touching on today indicate to me that Viacom CBS is definitely still following the Viacom part of the policy, which was we make stuff, we sell it to the highest bidder, whether that's Amazon with Coming to America 2, whether that's Yellowstone streaming rights to Peacock, that's how we do it, uh, while still providing enough of their own material to CBS All Access uh, to, and Showtime to make them successful. So it'll be interesting to see if they can continue to cross those streams well. Uh, but so far they are. Speaking of CBS All Access, Star Trek Discovery Season 3 premiered this week uh, and has already been approved for a fourth season. Fourth season of Star Trek Discovery will go into production November 2nd. Netflix released a trailer for The Crown Season 4 premiering November 15th. This is the period that covers Charles and Diana getting married. And there's a trailer out for his Dark Materials next season, which returns to HBO November 16th. Uh, this, I probably should have written this on the doc and actually found an article to verify, but, but, uh, I remember hearing that Ted Lasso has already been approved for a season three as well. Yes. We talked about that on this very show. Oh, uh, doggone it. Before. That was last week. All right. um, I don't or, hold on to things. Or did we, did we know. talk about the other season? We talked about them getting more seasons, but I think they've gotten even yeah, more Yeah, I thought seasons. it was a few days ago, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if we talked about it I know it they got week. two seasons at once and we talked about that on the show. Okay, cool. All right. Let's talk about what we've got our eyes on. What have you been watching there, Brian? Uh, you know what? Uh, HBO Max. It's a fertile new land that I got for free because I have AT&T for internet and uh, I'm pillaging it and watching everything I can. I watched uh, the South Park pandemic special, but man, oh man, did I enjoy Class Action Park, the documentary about the notorious park up in Vernon, New Jersey, that I had the opportunity to spend a day at when I was teaching magic at a summer camp up in upstate New York, man, 20 years ago. And 20 plus years, 25 years ago, holy cow. Wow. And it's, it's really wild because uh, as they describe how everything happened, for example, the guy who owned the place just didn't hire engineers, just had an idea for rides. He had one uh, a water slide that you got going so fast, you're essentially in pre free fall. And then the water slide did a loop to loop. It went into a tube and you went uh, completely 360 vertical. And uh, to test it out, he just started waving hundred dollar bills and invited everybody to hop in and go. And people came out with like broken clavicles and whatnot. And he says, oh, we should add some padding. So he added some padding and he said, started waving hundred dollar bills. And then people came out with all these slashes and lacerations all over their body and they, they said well what's going on they open up the ride they look inside and they figured out that the lacerations were coming from the teeth that were missing from the previous testers that was embedded in the padding <laughs> it's class bonkers. action park i get it now okay true story Oh, that's amazing uh i i want to give a shout out to star trek discovery uh which i thought premiered very strong um, they set up, I won't give any spoilers, but they, they set up an immediate obstacle, uh, for Burnham. Uh, they didn't give you all the answers to the questions that you have at the end of the last season. Uh, they introduced a new world, essentially a new universe, uh, and started doling out some of the rules of that world, uh, and, and a little bit of hope, uh, at the end. So, uh, I like it so far. I mean this in a non-spoilery way, but I, I think it's not out of school to say that many Star Trek series start one way and then find their voice over multiple seasons. And you can see the difference in the, in them. Uh, you know, certainly next generation is an example of that, uh, deep space nine, certainly, you know, things changed over the first few seasons. Are you seeing a similar thing with discovery or is it sticking to one style yeah. and guide? I feel like last season is when they really found their voice, right? This That was the season where I'm like, oh, okay, they know what the show is. It, it had some twists and turns and yanks. and like, we think we're doing this. Oh, wait, no, we're not. We're that. And then they tore up that rule book, which was very risky, and said, actually, uh, all bets are off. The characters that you love are in an entirely different situation now. And everything you've learned over the past three seasons really doesn't matter anymore except for 
whether you like these characters or not, uh, which is bold and risky. And we'll see how it plays out. Uh, but so far, so good. Right on. Bryce, what should we be on the lookout for? Hey, we got a recommendation from George. George writes, uh, the show I want to recommend is Emergency Call on ABC. It's also on Hulu. The show focuses on real 911 calls and the dispatchers taking the calls. As a 911 dispatcher, I can state that the show is the most accurate depiction of my job hmm. that I've seen on TV and movies. I wish to spread the word of the show so people know what happens when they call 911 and how hard we work behind the scenes of public safety. I've loved listening, listening to the show since Frame Rate Days and it's a great commute. Listen, have a happy day, George. Thank you, George. Yeah, Holy this looks cow. interesting. My... um. My my father works with nine one one operators, and you know you, I, I think people don't kind of get what it looks like inside of a nine one one center. They think it's like you know uh, millions of people and super in, intense all the time. And it's it's I mean it does have intense moments, but it's also got low periods. I mean it, it's kind of a call center <laughs> at the end of the day, yeah, right? Basically, yeah. Uh, uh, Luke Wilson hosts this. He, um, but this is like a non-scripted documentary. So it, they actually have like he's doing his version of um, uh, what's his name uh, Walsh, who did uh, America's Most Wanted. You know, sort sure, of, sure, uh, yeah, or, or yeah. Shatner. Uh, this this feels like a reverse cops. Yeah, it, yeah. It's saying instead mm -hmm. of being out on the beat trying to pretend like we're following typical cops on their on their walks, which they were following actual cops, but how typical it was was up for debate. Mm -hmm. This is we're inside a call center and we're going to see the drama the, of everything that you saw on cops from the other end. And I think yeah. that's an interesting take. You know, I, I, I have dual impulses that part of me thinks that anything that is real drama, like, uh, Hey, I'm glad that, that my husband having a heart attack made for good television, I guess, you know, there's that ghoulish aspect that kind of grosses me out about reality stuff. But on the flip side is, as as you mentioned, Bryce, like like, hey man, this is a real job. Also, all of this by definition is paid for by taxes and is on the public record. That's why you're able to requisition mm -hmm. and request nine one one calls and stuff. So I I, I find mm -hmm. myself kind of pulled in both ways. Um, yeah. and it's interesting. Seeing some of the clips on YouTube, it seems like it's a mixture of high intensity and maybe some more levity. You know, uh, 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 there's one clip I saw where a dispatcher is taking a call and. The, the woman on the phone says, oh, hold on. And you can hear her ordering food at f like a fast food place. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think there, there it seems like there's maybe a, a, a mix there between the very serious drama and, and maybe some more banal. Yeah, what's the break room here. cake like at a 911 call yeah. center? Like, I mean, that's it, the kind of stuff I think people are interested I in. I just want to know what kind of call reveal, get somebody to turn down to the camera, stare down the barrel like Jim from the office and give, give a smirk. Okay. <laughs> also, probably something that they could easily produce during quarantine. I mean, this is a new show. This came out in September. Um, seems like, you know, the way that, you know, those places are. I mean, yeah, they have to show up to work any, anyway. Right. Yeah. Time. They're not working uh, from home. Yeah. So that's Emergency Call. It's on ABC and it's on Hulu as well. If you've got something you should be on the lookout for, email us, cordkillers at gmail.com. Thank you. Hey there, Brian. Is that a doghouse system or are you just streaming really good stuff I'm on high quality machinery? I'm just happy to have high-end systems, top of the line with best of breed customer service, man. The more I talk to the folks over at Doghouse Systems, the more... Uh, it's it's like having a buddy who you really, really trust, who you could call and say, presentation is tomorrow. This is not working. And they'll either try to fix it over the phone if they can't. I mean, I hear these crazy stories of them overnighting systems so that somebody can make the the, the particular presentation or what have you. Head on over to doghousesystems.com slash rogue. They hook, hit, hooked us up with uh, thousands and thousands of dollars of all the power that makes all everything happen here at Diamond Club Studios. And uh, we owe them for it. So head on over to doghousesystems.com slash rogue. And we're paying them through your purchases. That's right. So Use please. promo code rogue. I guarantee you're going to love it. And they'll get guarantee it. I mean, there's money back guarantees. Let's move on to the front lines. Front lines. Apple launched Apple Music TV in the US, a free live streaming channel of curated music videos that play in the Apple Music app and the Apple TV app. Uh, you can also go to apple.co slash Apple Music TV, but that just launches the Apple TV app. Uh, the channel will premiere new videos every Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Apple also says the channel will feature special curated music video blocks 
and live shows and events, as well as chart countdowns and guests. Uh, right now, they're doing the top 100 Apple Music songs of all time, all time being since Apple Music launched not that long ago. So it's all modern stuff. Uh, they're going to do an all Bruce Springsteen day on Thursday, leading up to the release of his new album and a release of a documentary. Uh, that'll include like a thousand fans getting a, a virtual behind the scenes hangout with Bruce Springsteen. Uh, so it's MTV. Brian, I mean, I mean, that was my that was going to be my whole joke. Like Apple presents music television. How would you abbreviate that? <laughs> but 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 again, I mean, what was right for MTV is almost certainly right for Apple and uh, MTV, of course. Uh, their big uh, gotcha was the fact that all their content was free. It was promote it was essentially ads. They ran ads for albums 24 hours a day. And I'm sure Apple has uh, similar sweetheart deals. I, I imagine with Apple, it's even easier, which is we already paid for it because we run Apple Music, right? Yeah. Uh, so so this is a way, and this is free. You don't have to be an Apple Music subscriber. You don't have to be an Apple TV Plus subscriber. Uh, it's free for everybody to watch. So it's a promotional vehicle, not only just for the music, but also for Apple Music and Apple TV Plus, particularly for Apple Music. Like, hey, you like these songs? More where that came from. You might want to subscribe to Apple Music. I'm sure there'll be a lot of integration where it's like, hey, if you liked this block of videos you were watching, get the playlist on Apple Music. Uh, I didn't see anything like that yet, though. Right now, it's just a very pared down, no interactivity. Can't even tell what song is playing until it gets to the end and it, the little, you know, CG comes up. Uh, I wonder if this will catch on it's a very lean back experience that those of us who grew up in the eighties with MTV, when they played videos, remember, but I don't know if that's something people want anymore. I think a universal thing that everybody wants is to be the one who knew about that song before their friend knew about it. And if they could position themselves leaning on the curation and say, Hey, we know what's going to be the next big thing. You know, that's why on Sunday nights in TV, I would stay up watching 120 minutes is because you yeah, know, yeah. alternative rock. Like I can know this before anyone else does. And Apple Music One is their radio version of this. They launched that as Beats One, you may remember, several years ago, and they still run it. So it must be worth it for them to still run it and to create a video version of it, essentially. On top of that, I'd be really curious what kind of data they'll be able to pull out of all this. Like, can they mm -hmm. can they cause an avalanche? Can they, you know, track, you know, we showed this and then this just based popular. on on watch time and like what made people tune in and out and all that. Yeah, what, yeah. But, but also like like since they own Apple Music, like, OK, we played this video. Then we saw a uh -huh. spike and, and it spiked and, over here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Netflix has removed all free trial package options for new members. A post at Netflix Help Center reads, quote, free trials are not available, but you can still sign up and take advantage of all Netflix has to offer. There are <laughs> no words, contracts, no cancellation fees and no commitments. Back in June, Disney Plus Stop, uh, stopped offering free trials for new subscribers before Hamilton was added to the service on July 4th. Netflix has Aaron Sorkin's Oscars Hopeful, The Trial of Chicago 7, Season 4 of The Crown, and David Fincher's Mank arriving over the next several weeks, which may have prompted the similar move. Man, I I, I, I don't know if that's a flex or, or, or behind the or scenes. Somebody was saying, I don't want anyone seeing it for free. Uh, I think it's... I, I mean, the timing might have to do with the release of Trial of Chicago 7 and Mank uh, and even The Crown, but I think the decision is purely bean counting. Uh, this is how many free trials we're getting. This is how many of them are converting. Used to be pretty close. Now it's lots of free trials, fewer conversions. We're getting more signups just from, you know, word of mouth and marketing let's let's drop this it's being abused it's not worth it anymore that that's my guess and and at some point i can imagine somebody kicking in the door to the, all the big wigs and saying guys they know what netflix is stop showing it to them <laughs> right right they, we don't we need to it. build we, awareness we all get it we all know what yeah, it is yeah yeah you're right uh youtube tv is integrating nfl fantasy football into the app uh, to set it up, you log into NFL.com. It'll bring in your fantasy team and matchup while you're watching an actual football game. Again, this is YouTube TV, not just YouTube, YouTube TV. So you're watching a football game just on a regular old network. You can select a fantasy tab, which will pull up your player's scores, while the video window will then shrink to the top corner of the screen. You can toggle between multiple fantasy football accounts if you've got more than one person in your household. Fantasy players that are in the game you're watching will rise to the top, and that adjusts if you change channels to another game. And Google says it plans to bring more apps to the YouTube TV platform if they can be incorporated into the content.
Uh, you know, that, that 20, 30 years ago, that would sound like nonsense gobbledygook, but, but, but now it's like, yeah, of course. I mean, some number of people, yeah, they're watching the game, but they don't really care who wins or loses. They're watching one particular player. And I, th I think this kind of thing, like I could see some Amazon X-ray kind of stuff being integrated in. So your Rotten Tomatoes account or your IMDB account uh, would, would integrate in and then you would get like some, some really good stuff uh, associated with that, uh, that that's even deeper and more integrated to your personal tastes while you're watching an award show or, or other things that are better than that that I haven't thought of. But this is something that over-the-top services like YouTube TV can do easier. Comcast does stuff like this, but it's harder for them to integrate into it. Yeah. The Apple TV app is now available for some Sony TVs. The Apple TV app gives access to Apple TV Plus, Apple TV channel add-ons, and any TV and movies in your Apple library. Yeah, I, I assume these are just going to go everywhere, right? Yeah, uh, we're just yeah, we're just checking off the list as they come out, folks. So if you're waiting for your TV or your platform, here's another one. Uh, Warner Media announced it will discontinue HBO and WTB TV channels in India, Pakistan, the Maldives, and Bangladesh December 15th. In India, HBO has struggled for market share, ranking behind competitors like Times Internet's Movies Now, Star Movies, and Sony Picks, despite offering the channel in the country for more than 20 years. Warner will still offer Cartoon, Cartoon Network and Pogo in India and distribute CNN International there as well, but HBO content will be available in India through a syndication deal with Disney's Hotstar service, the home of Disney Plus content. So in India, you get HBO and Disney on the same service. Uh, why not? I mean, that 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 sounds very, very weird to Americanized ears, but man, right. the brief time that I lived overseas, when you're seeing the mishmash of all content and like no networks mean anything because of international deals, I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, less surprised by this kind of weirdness. Well, it, it made me think of BritBox, which in the U.S. is a combination of multiple British channels services, right? And I, I know they have a BritBox launching in Britain now, so it kind of, you know, fudges my metaphor. But it's it's the same they thing, which is like, box. yeah, <laughs> yeah, there, there they just call it box. Uh, but, <laughs> sorry, oh, that's, a, but, that's a better bit. God damn. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. sorry. I didn't mean to correct your bit. <laughs> no, but, no, no, it was well earned. I wrote uh, it in dry but, erase. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, you, you got to remember like HBO and Disney, even Disney uh, aren't necessarily as big as they are everywhere else. It's, it's, it's funny because I see um, uh, just last week we had an episode of The Modern Rogue where we were talking about various candy flavors. And we men, we got a lot of comments from like Smarties or chocolate. And it was like, what? What are you? And then arguments ensue. Uh, oh, you know, it, that that reminds me, like Canal Plus, big channel in France, a lot of their stuff shows up on HBO. Huh. Uh, and a lot of BBC stuff will show up on HBO, too. So this is kind of like that. HBO is saying, well, our stuff will just show up on Hotstar. Yeah. All right, let's talk about some dispatches from the front. I should I should clarify that the the subject heading here was conspiracy theory for this one. Okay, Ken has a conspiracy theory for us. Let us entertain it. Number 1, the Paramount decree ends allowing movie studios to own theaters. Now, some movie studios could have owned theaters, but the big ones were still under the Paramount Decree, the ones from the 40s. Which, so that is fact. That is it, not conspiracy. That, that happens fact. next year, 2021, right? Yeah. The Paramount Decree is sunsetting. Movie studios can own theaters. All movie studios can own theaters going forward. You know, interestingly, Netflix can own a theater right now because Netflix was not subject to the Paramount Decree because Netflix wasn't around in the 40s. So number two, due to the pandemic, movie studios skip theaters and go straight to streaming. That's a fact. We're seeing that. We were just talking about Soul earlier as an example. Number three, theaters struggle with no new movies. I think that could happening. be called a fact. Confirmed. As well. Definitely. Yeah, definitely happening. Number four, movie studios see theaters struggling and start purposely moving more movies to streaming. Now we're getting into the conspiracy realm. I mean, I actually, depending on how you squint, happening. 
It's kind of, like soul, soul, soul is supposed soul to be in the theater. Patient zero. Did happening. they do it purposely to hurt, or was it just a reaction? That's mm, up to you I, to mean, I mean, if they were charging for soul, I would say this is speculation. But mm -hmm. to give it away, essentially, mm -hmm. quote unquote, for free to anyone who has Disney, we're graying the line here. We're yeah. graying the line for sure. Uh, number five, theater debt piles up, forcing them into bankruptcy. Happening. Well, the debt is definitely piling up. They haven't filed the bankruptcy quite yeah although, although, although but... if you count shuttering you know some of them are closed indefinitely depends and... on whether you take bankruptcy are you an originalist to ken's theory sure, sure. And, but but but, but, but in spirit i'm saying like sure uh, sure like I'm, you're I'm, a I'm living still with ken's them. theory We're walking hand okay. in hand uh, number six, movie studios swoop in and buy up theater chains. Okay, now we're in the realm of Ken's speculation. He's like, aha, they have driven them to bankruptcy. They swoop in and buy them for cheap. Number seven, movie studios negotiate with themselves for new theater windows and revenue splits. Hey, I'd like a short new theater revenue, me. Great, me, not a problem. Uh, movie studios have it within their power, says Ken, to destroy theaters and blame it on the pandemic. Now, I'll go a step farther on this conspiracy theory. And forgive me, Tom, uh, I, I do so many shows and it's hard for me to keep track of where I've had crazy theories and where I haven't, but I don't <laughs> think I've talked about it here. I'm convinced that uh, number one, just like uh, we never really went back to normal after 9-11, we're never really gonna go back to normal after the pandemic. And as a result, what'll happen is uh, uh, movies will become a kind of a theme park experience. Imagine. Disney swoops in, buys a bunch of theaters, makes them into kind of a roughly Chuck E. Cheese kind of environment where mm -hmm. you go, there's rides and games, and then you're called for it's your like family movie. It's like the ESPN movie. zone right. for, or, 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 or the, the Dave and Busters. Yeah, yeah, or, or, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I forget what they call it. But um, uh, but yeah, it'll be it'll be like that. You know that you'll be spending about 100 to $150. You know that you and your family of five will have a full evening, and in there will be a meal, a bunch of games, and watching a two hour Pixar movie or whatever. I think that is the only way this conspiracy theory makes sense to me. And it makes a lot of sense. Uh, <laughs> whether it's, whether it's done on purpose the way Ken uh, imagines or not, I, I think that could work out this way because my first reaction is theaters are low margin. Uh, studios don't want to buy into a bunch of low margin stuff. So they're probably not likely to want to do this. However, what you described is no longer low margin, right? And it's what Disney does really well. It's also what NBC Universal has experience doing with NBC, with the Universal Studios theme parks. So that could be something that those companies say, hey, we've got this talent. Let's use it and make a money making business out of theaters. I don't think they go in and just buy theaters and run them. Because that's, that's just not going to make them enough money. I agree. I agree 100%. It'll be some kind of fundamental shift. And I think part of my impulse here is fueled by the fact that I've been conditioned for uh, 20 years with the Alamo Drafthouse experience to associate high margin, you know, mm -hmm. expensive. Like, I mean, it's been a long time since I've seen a movie and not spent 50 bucks because somehow they're able to figure out how to charge me $50 for a beer and a pizza or something. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Uh, then we get an email from Clifford who says, Hey guys, on this week's show, Merrill was talking about John Favreau's show chef. Uh, and Clifford wanted to remind us that back in the two thousands, Favreau had a similar show on IFC called dinner for five. Each week he would have five guests that he had worked with in the past for dinner at a nice restaurant that had a private dining room. As they ate dinner, they would talk about working on the movies or shows in the past because of the private setting. You got to see how these celebrities were in real life. They would talk a lot of inside baseball about Hollywood and the making of films in general. You would also hear a good amount of humorous or interesting anecdotes from what happened on set, et cetera. The episodes show up on Netflix from time to time. You can also find some of them on YouTube and each season is available on DVD as well. Uh, you know, I've heard universally good things about this show. And I know that our friends over at Film Riot, uh, they did one, they, they put together a show essentially aping the structure of it to talk about movies and stuff. And I think, and this is probably an unfair thing for me to speculate on since I've not seen the original, but from the description and everything I've heard, it felt like that's what they were aiming for with the Disney Plus hooray for our The Mandalorian show. And and just, uh, uh, but it was well, absent. At least that first episode, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, but, but but it was just absent the authentic, we're speaking off the recordness. It felt yeah. like It felt like they were aping the structure of that, only nobody could speak completely candidly. 
Yeah, yeah. They, they, they maybe have tried to capture some of that. Uh, Dinner for Five was great. I watched several episodes of that. Uh, and I sometimes wonder how he got people to agree to let some of those come out. I mean, nothing really tragic was in there, but you get some really candid conversations in there that you would not have got up on a panel when they were looking at other people, like stuff they said, cause they, they were lured into the sense of security of like, Oh, I'm in a private dining room with my friends. Uh, I, I believe the trick is you have them sign a release and then they don't see it. Until <laughs> and then it comes they have out. no choice in the matter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, possibly could be it. Uh, well, uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, of course, we, we love having you with us. Thank you for supporting us at patreon.com slash cord killers. Our website is cordkillers.com. Our email address, don't forget, cordkillers at gmail.com. And of course, you can catch us live if you're just listening to this on demand or watching it later, twitch.tv slash night attack, also on diamondclub.tv, Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern. 4 p.m. Pacific. We'll see you again next time. Hey, Tom Merritt. Yes, Brian Brushwood. Know who I love even more than my own children? Your other children? No, not my wife. I know what you're saying. I love our $5 patrons. These are the people that keep us live, live and independent. Thank you so much, $5 patrons. You know what? I love them more than not life itself, because then I'd be dead and I couldn't appreciate them, but really, really, really close. And I'm so thankful that they are here to make this show happen. Thank you so much to all of our $5 a month patrons. You guys are wizards. You're champions. Thank you, everyone. You're heroes. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>